Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bassam Haddad, and we are here with uh, five of our remarkable scholars who will be addressing the question of international law and the war on Palestine. Uh, this is the ninth teach-in in the Gaza in Context Collaborative Series, which includes 22 of our uh, university partners and research institutions. We have had an earlier or uh, a teaching earlier today with Youssef Munayir on colonial narratives, uh, which you can access uh, now at any point on Jadalia's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jadalia. And uh, we are now going to, I'm going to introduce uh, my co-moderator who will actually uh, take it from here for the most part. Uh, this again is uh, part of a series that you can find in its entirety on palestineincontext.org. It also includes the War on Palestine podcast as well as a, an archived and categorized list of solidarity statements on Palestine. And coming soon is a, uh, an expansive module with resources on, um, on Palestine and the Israel-Palestine conflict. Let me also thank everyone who has participated in this series so far and those people who are doing the work behind the scenes that are usually unfortunately nameless, but you will be able to find their names on the website as well because they make everything happen. And with this, I'll introduce um, my friend and scholar, Lisa Hajar, who is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a co-editor of Jadalia. Her scholarship focuses on international law, war and conflict, human rights and torture. She is the author of Courting Conflict, the Israeli Military Court System in the West Bank and Gaza, University of California Press, 2005. That's not part of the title, that's the publisher. It's my intonation. Also, she's the author of Torture, a Sociology of Violence and Human Rights from Rutledge, 2013, and The War in Court, Inside the Long Fight Against Torture, also University of California Press, 2022. With that, I'll uh, hand the floor over to Lisa, and I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to introduce our three distinguished speakers in the order in which they'll speak. So first is Richard Falk, who is the Richard G. Um, Milbank Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and Chair of Global Law in the Faculty of Law at Queen Mary University, London. Um, Falk is the, has published over 50 books in his lifetime, and in 2021, Foreign Affairs selected his 1972 book, This Endangered Planet, as one of the six most influential books on global issues published in the last hundred years. Daryl Lee is Associate Professor of Anthropology and an Associate Member of the Law School at the University of Chicago, and he's a licensed attorney in New York and Illinois. He has lived in Gaza, where he worked for the Palestine Center for Human Rights, and he also worked there with Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem. And Noura Erekat is a human rights attorney and associate professor of Africana Studies and the program in criminal justice at Rutgers University. She's a co-founding editor of Jedalia and a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies. She's also the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. So Richard, it's your turn. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm very glad to be part of this uh, teaching which I think is a very good thing at this time. I want to concentrate for my uh, minutes before you uh, on a single issue, which is why do we care about international law if it's not being enforced? And the Palestinians, above all others, have reason to be skeptical about the value of having international law on their side because it has so rarely helped them in their struggle against oppressive governance and the denial of their fundamental rights. 
so what I'm really talking about is a implementation crisis. That is that you can have law uh, support your claims, but nothing happens. And it raises the question, why should we be so committed to it? As And many of us, including myself, are very committed to uh, showing the degree of defiance of international law by Israel and its accomplices in this recent Gaza uh, genocidal assault. Uh, one has to understand that international law in many areas works quite effectively in terms of being enforced. Where it doesn't work, at least at the level of interstate behavior, is where geopolitical interests take precedence. And that unfortunately happens in the peace and security area and the area of accountability for crimes. This was not this hasn't been a accident. It was part of the reconstruction of world order after uh, the Second World War. Uh, there would be no other explanation for the veto in the Security Council if it wasn't for the objective of giving the five most powerful and dangerous countries an exemption from the obligation to comply with international law. And that was also reproduced in the Nuremberg and Tokyo uh, trials where um, the victors didn't subject themselves to legal scrutiny. And even though among the worst crimes of World War II were the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were not part of the inquiry that was allowed to be made. So what I'm trying to suggest is that there is a condition of geopolitical primacy in the Uh, strategic interests are at stake in a significant way, uh, law will not be implemented at least from uh, that intergovernmental uh, framework uh, which it encompasses the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and the UN system as a whole. And this, this is also reflected in the fact that uh, the geopolitical actors make use of international law in a debilitating way. Uh, for instance, uh, the United States is very eager to deal with international law when its adversaries or enemies are perceived as violating international law. In other words, it has one standard for itself and another standard for its adversaries or enemies. And the standard for itself is very extreme. It's even passed a law that forbids the International Criminal Court to ever indict Americans for war crimes and has passed congressional legislation to that effect. So the, the premise is that geopolitical primacy blocks the intergovernmental and uh, institutional implementation of international law in the peace, security, and accountability, accountability areas. 
But why it matters is that it legitimates the treatment of issues such as the very flagrant extreme violations of international humanitarian law uh, by Israel in Gaza as something that is so vividly relevant that it influences both the way in which international public opinion is formed and the way people are mobile to uh, protest and object, and that in turn exerts a certain influence. It's hard to tell how much in this present uh, crisis situation it has altered the language of uh, the supporters of Israel, but it hasn't really altered, as far as we can tell, the substantive behavior or what it is that is inflicting the suffering on the civilian population of Gaza. So legitimacy is important in struggles involving uh, tensions between opposed peoples. But what it cannot achieve at this stage is compliance. Compliance is very elusive and can only be achieved if the geopolitical interests are sufficiently challenged or successfully challenged uh, so that the, those actors that block implementation are compelled for pragmatic reasons to change their positions. And this happened to the uh, US in the Vietnam War, and it happened in South Africa on the apartheid issues. Uh, they only became susceptible to implementation when their calculus of interests led them to believe they'd be better off complying than continuing to violate. But the politics of inducing that compliance is why international law matters despite this failure of implementation as it appears in the books as the sort of formalistic understanding of international law from a legal positivist point of view that looks at the rules and looks at the behavior and says, uh, tries to devote all of its intellectual energy to showing the gap between the behavior and the rules. And what I'm essentially saying is that that's not enough to affect behavior, that you have to have a politics of compliance that supplements the intellectual and or jurisprudential demonstration of unlawfulness. And that that's something that seems to me to be missing in the most of the discourse that's addressed to the importance of international law or the value of having international law on the side of the uh, victim of uh, unlawful and immoral behavior. And this, this uh, I think, is something that challenges the way in which the world is organized. It challenges it uh, both in terms of uh, the institutional 
uh, backing and 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 also the degree to which law can be made to override geopolitics. And that, that would be a, a radical shift in the nature of world order, because the Westphalian state interstate framework has always been premised on this law for the weak and, and discretion for the strong. What uh, a Mexican delegate to the UN uh, founding conference called uh, an organization that holds the mice accountable while the tigers run free. Mm. And, and it's, it's that issue that seems to me that is essential to address if we want a compliant international order. Let me stop there. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, Daryl? Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's made time to um, attend today. I know there are a lot of demands on everyone's attention and time and energy. Um, so I don't take it lightly. I also want to recognize and thank the organizers and sponsors of this event. Um, of course, uh, among them, Sam and Lisa. And also, I just want to acknowledge how honored I'm be, I am to be in the, in the company of, uh, of Richard and Mura, who I admire both very much. Um, uh, today, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, genocide. And um, I think it's very clear that we are in a qualitatively new stage of the struggle for Palestinian liberation and solidarity with that struggle. I don't think any of us quite knows what the exact shape of this new stage is, and I'm not going to try to encompass it in any way, but I think that one of the implications is that it also places new demands and new challenges for those who want to use international law as a tool in support of the Palestinian struggle. And one aspect of the new stage for international lawyers, I think, is really reckoning with the concept of genocide and what's unfolding in Gaza and recognizing it as genocidal. Um, this is not to say that uh, genocide has never been discussed or never been practiced before in this context. Um, folks might be aware that the 1982 massacre in the refugee camps of uh, Sabran Shatila in Beirut was also declared to be an act of genocide by the United Nations. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, genocide has become an increasingly prominent part of the way that movements are describing and making sense of the violence that's unfolding, the onslaught on Gaza, and that's for reasons that are entirely understandable. Not only are we seeing um, horrific levels of violence, but we are also seeing um, the highest levels, the highest echelons of the Israeli state giving us textbook examples of what genocidal intent is supposed to look like. Um, so on the one hand, this is a panel in which people who are Experts in international law are trying to share that expertise in a way that's helpful and meaningful um, to an audience that includes non-lawyers. But I also want to take note that I think of this really I hope we have not lost Daryl. If Daryl's connection might be weak. Hmm. 
I'll just wait a couple of seconds. Yeah, I think we may have lost him. He's calling back. He is calling back, so we have just a couple of seconds. I guess in the meantime, uh, I can share that we have a couple of uh, events coming up next week on media and the war. Another on Know Your Rights, which we will announce shortly. Sorry, Daryl, you, you, you were saying we have to take note of and then... Okay, um, I, I'm sitting in a multi-billion dollar research institute that apparently cannot afford decent Wi-Fi, so I apologize, but um, uh, I don't, what was I saying? Uh, we should take note of, but I guess at this point... Um, um, you were talking about the challenges um, for people who want to use international law with this pr present moment right. represents. Yes, yes, so the challenge of the moment is thinking with genocide and of giving the movement a legal vocabulary for um, for thinking with genocide and to support uh, movement goals and movement aspirations and to honor the way that Palestinians and other colonized peoples have always described the violence that they've experienced as genocidal. And that requires um, forms of lawyering that are both creative and also quite technical, um, but I think also requires a sensibility to be attuned to. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, anyway, I was just saying that, <clears throat> you know, this is just, you know, the, the, the short technical bit. Um, for folks who are not aware, genocide is, um, it's, it's a term enshrined in international law in a 1948 treaty that almost every country in the world has signed. And it's a bit weird that it's defined through the apparatus of criminal law, right? So when we think of these mass atrocities, right? Um, translating them through the framework of criminal law it, where you have like an individual who's being put on trial with a motive there's already a lot of weirdness that goes into that but be that as it may the crime is defined as uh, a certain there's like a list of acts like killing causing bodily or mental harm uh, uh, inflicting conditions of life that might that are calculated to destroy a group and that this these acts um, have to be committed with a certain special intent. And that intent is to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Um, now, I think, it's, I think there's mounting evidence that what's happening in Gaza, uh, that there's a very, very strong case to be made that what's happening in, in Gaza is, is genocidal. Um, I urge folks to check out the materials that have been churned out, especially by the Center for Constitutional Rights recently. They did a great emergency legal briefing paper um, just like less than two weeks into the start of these events. Um, they've also filed an emergency lawsuit um, against the Biden administration that will hopefully force them into court to actually explain um, why they think they are not complicit in genocide. So shout out to CCR for all of the work that they're doing. Um, the point being that the, the legal arguments are, um, they're very strong, um, but I don't want to belabor them today um, because as we see, and as we have seen, there is a whole discursive mass of distraction arguments that come up whenever people talk about genocide. Um, and these discursive, you know, these, these distractions, um, I think of them as the, the rules for talking about genocide. Um, they're not legal rules, right? They're just ways that discourse kind of gets framed. And I want to run through them a little bit just so folks are familiar with them and recognize them for what they are. Um, so um, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Um, I'm just going to show one slide. Okay, so can you guys see that? Okay, I'm gonna assume that you can yes. see it. Yes, sir. Okay, um, 
So I think this image helps to encapsulate um, the structure of public discourse when it comes to genocide in the West. And I'm talking about the things you want to say if you want to be taken seriously in journalism and academia in the nonprofit sector and in government, right? Because we know there's like this sensitivity around the, the so-called G word, right? So this at the bottom of the satellite image is Yad Vashem, which is the National Holocaust Memorial of, is of the State of Israel. And it's a world famous site. It's visited by um, you know, a great number of tourists every year, uh, children on school trips, heads of state come. It's kind of an obligatory um, stop. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'm sure many people are familiar with it. It, it, it projects the state of Israel's kind of narrative about the Holocaust. Um, and it's probably the most famous monument to uh, the atrocities of the Holocaust, which were atrocities committed thousands of miles away by another government. Um, on the adjacent hill, about like a kilometer away, or maybe one and a half kilometers away as the crow flies, uh, is where the Palestinian village of Deir Yassin once stood, um, the site of probably the most uh, infamous massacre of the 1948 Nakba. Um, and unlike most of the other hundreds of Palestinian villages that were ethnically cleansed during the Nakba, uh, the area scene was actually not razed to the ground. Um, instead, the houses of the village, uh, some of them were preserved and were converted into use as a mental health facility. Um, and if folks have heard of this thing called the Jerusalem syndrome, which is like this, um, this thing that tends to afflict tourists, Western tourists, when they come to Palestine, where they think they're like Jesus or some uh, biblical personage. Uh, this mental health hospital is actually uh, is, is well known for its research on the Jerusalem syndrome. Um, so uh, am I am I still sharing or I wanted to turn off the share? Yes, you're still yes, sharing. I placed, I placed oh. a bigger version of it. Oh, OK. OK, you can you can take it off. It's not that it's not that important. Um, but for me, what the image really encaps and I've done the walk from Yad Vashem to Deir Yassin. And it really kind of, uh, to me, brings home how certain kinds of mass atrocity are, uh, are memorialized and commemorated and have this whole apparatus, the whole cultural production around memorializing them, while others that happen, you know, like an actual site of mass atrocity next door uh, is, you know, just like completely unacknowledged and met with denial and gaslighting. And I think that really um, exemplifies uh, sort of the rules of genocide and how people talk about genocide. So I think of these rules, I kind of divide them into two categories. Uh, they're the rules that are about um, how the powerful get to use the term and get to exploit it. Um, and then there are the rules that are about preventing the less powerful from talking about genocide and making use of it. Right. So I think in the first category, uh, the rules are one that um, genocide is a uniquely evil and horrible thing um, that justifies any extraordinary measure to stop it. Um, and again, just to emphasize, none of these rules that I'm going to talk about are actually based in international law. Right. So there's nothing that says that genocide is like a worse crime than crimes against humanity or war crimes or whatever. But there's this political kind of understanding that genocide is so extreme that it licenses pretty much anything in comparison, right? So uh, the Israeli historian, Benny Morris, you know, when he was talking about the Nekba, he said at one point, like, well, you know, it really boiled down to a choice between genocide for us or ethnic cleansing for them, and ethnic cleansing is not as bad. So there you go. Um, I think the second rule, you know, these are all like obvious, but I want to just kind of, you know, bring them out. Um, the second rule is that uh, the, the Shoah or the Holocaust is the paradigmatic case of genocide. Um, so when you put these rules, to, when you put these two rules together, then you run into a third rule, which is that genocide is defined by international law. Now, I gave the definition a few minutes ago, and um, the thing with that definition is in order to get almost every country in the world to sign on to that treaty, that definition had to be loaded with little bits of uh, 
ambiguity and loopholes, right? So the language of to destroy in a whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, um, there's a lot of stuff in there that lawyers can work with to draw fine distinctions, to raise questions. You know, what does it mean to destroy a group as such? You know, um, what about groups that aren't defined as racial, ethnical, national, or religious? Um, when we say a group is, when we say there's an intent to destroy a group in part, what does that mean? How do we define this part? There's all of these ways in which it's possible for lawyers to create um, confusion and doubt and to manipulate the definition and um, and to really treat it in a very, very narrow fashion. Now, whether or not those arguments succeed, I think has everything to do with popular pressure, right? So my take is let the lawyers figure out those technical arguments. What's really important is that everybody creates a collective environment in which those kinds of technical objections don't have the political backing that they've had up until this point, right? Because what happens is the, the, the confusion or the ambiguity in these technical, like super, super technical debates over the legal definition, um, they end up creating enough paralysis whereby in practice, who gets to mobilize the like overwhelming rhetorical power of genocide? It's the people who claim, um, who can mobilize a kind of moral authority connected to the Holocaust. And that is number one, the state of Israel, right? On the basis of embodying the historical victimhood of the Jewish people. And number two, the United States of America on the theory that somehow uh, it was the, the savior that liberated European Jews from Nazi death camps. Now, these are deeply ahistorical claims on many levels, but my point is they are effective claims. They are claims that get people to do things, right? Whether or not they believe them is a different issue. Um, so, um, so it's the interplay between like the, the, the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities in the technical legal definition and these like extra legal discursive rules that creates a lot of the, the problem space around talking about genocide. Um, now, uh, ever since genocide, the term was, in, was enshrined in the 1948 convention, uh, there's always been gatekeeping of genocide, right? So for example, um, the Civil Rights Congress, which was a sort of um, leftist African-American organization submitted this meticulous document to the UN called We Charge Genocide that you know tried to talk about lynching and Jim Crow and white supremacist regimes in the United States in terms of genocide. And the, the man who, was, who basically coined the term genocide, Raphael Lemkin, immediately set about trying to, um, you know, disprove their claims and to show, well, it's not really genocide, it's just oppression, you know, these sorts of arguments. So this is a very, very long history of people trying to gatekeep the idea of genocide and to use it as a, as a weapon, like any weapon of mass destruction, right? It's, its distribution has to be very, very carefully controlled. Um, so if genocide is like a rhetorical WMD, then, um, you know, we need to make sure that all of the inconvenient peoples of the earth um, can't be allowed to make uh, publicly effective genocide accusations. So one of the rules, of course, I mean, we're, we're familiar with the basic one of just Palestinians are presumptively genocidal for breathing, right? And especially breathing slogans like from the river to the sea, but we could just say breathing. Um, but a softer version of that rule is what I think of as um, genocide austerity. So this rule basically says, hey, um, you think this situation is genocide, and it's not, but not only is it not genocidal, by making an incorrect accusation of genocide, you're really cheapening the term because if people overuse it, it's gonna lose its special power and you're kind of ruining it for everybody else, right? Again, no legal basis to this. It's just a rhetorical device that you see over and over and over again, right? So genocide austerity definitely raises a huge red flag. Um, another one I can think of is like, genocide, um, inflation, but atrocity deflation. So the way this argument tends to go is something like, um, you know, this mass horrific act of violence that we're seeing, it's not genocidal because of some narrow, weird technical thing. Um, so it's really just a war crime or a crime against humanity. Now, what's weird about that move is that 
ordinarily calling something a war crime or a crime against humanity should also be like a big deal and should be mobilizing and should be, you know, uh, or, but in, in this type of move, because genocide is inflated as like the greatest of all evils, suddenly when it's something is not genocidal, it, there's almost like this energy leaves the room in these types of conversations, right? So you, you see the way that people sometimes deflect the genocide accusation by admitting that something is war crimes or crimes against humanity, but they're admitting it in a way that doesn't actually create any follow through, right? Um, and then the third, of, the third form that I think is really, is becoming more common now is what I call the genocide distraction distraction. Um, and that argument basically goes, hey, um, this genocide thing is really problematic. Like, did you hear what like that dude Daryl Lee just talked about in the in that sort of webinar? Like, it's a horrible definition. It was crafted to protect the interests of powerful states. Um, it's technically very narrow. Therefore, don't use it. Right now, the problem with that argument, of course, is that it completely flies in the face of how Palestinians and other colonized people actually understand and translate the violence that they've experienced, and it forfeits. Uh, you know, a term that does galvanize people for better or for worse, right? And it's been interesting to see in some of these like legacy media publications, there have been really thoughtful articles pointing out all of the problems in the genocide con uh, concept, um, but they've come out at exactly the moment when Palestinian uses of the term genocide have begun to gain traction, right? Which is to, to me completely like crazy, right? That we have this term that on the one hand is extremely problematic and extremely narrow, but at the very moment that it's actually being used in a way that is potentially useful and actually does challenge the status quo, suddenly, oh, it's too problematic, right? So I think that's another thing that I want to sort of uh, draw people's attention to in, you know, as these debates kind of evolve and, and deepen in, in, the, in the time ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Nora, it's your turn. I want to echo um, Daryl's gratitude for the organizers, uh, this coalitionary movement that has brought together this amazing teaching series, um, spearheaded by Bassam, thank you, and now anchored by Lisa here. The honor of being with you, Richard, and you, Daryl. Um, I, I hate that it has to be under these circumstances, but it is lovely to see you. I want to actually go back and forth with you, Daryl, and I think that we're going to get that opportunity in conversation. But let me um, let me embark on my offering here, which was to discuss, you know, to discuss this current moment as really um, uh, built on a chronic lack of accountability, so that each of the things that we're seeing here is actually built on other violations that have gone unaddressed that without which wouldn't have produced this moment. So to begin, I wanna read you a couple testimonies um, from survivors in Gaza. This is Ibtihama Samouni, 31 years old. She lived with her children in the Al Zaytun neighborhood of Gaza City. On January 4th, the Israeli army force forced approximately 110 of Al Zaytun's residents into Ibtisam's home. At around 7 a.m. the next morning, Israeli military forces fired two tank shells at the house without warning, killing two of Ibtisam's children, Rizqa, 14, and Faris, 12. When the survivors attempted to flee, Israeli soldiers shot at them. Ibtisam's son, Abdullah, 7, who had been injured in the initial shelling, remained in the home among his deceased siblings for four days before Israeli forces permitted a rescue by medical personnel. After medical personnel removed the injured, Israeli forces fired a missile at the home, collapsing it over the bodies remaining inside. The dead remained beneath the rubble for two more weeks before the Israeli army permitted medical personnel to remove their bodies for burial. In this other testimony, this is of Rohiyah and Najjar, aged 47, who lived in the village of Khuzaa in the Khan Yunus district. On January 13, 2009, Israeli forces ordered residents of her neighborhood to march to the village center. Rohiya led a group of 20 women out of her home and into it an adjoining alley. They all displayed white flags that they had made from sheets and scarves. 
Upon entering the alley, an Israeli sniper shot Rauhiya in her left temple, killing her instantly. Israeli forces then prevented medical personnel from reaching her body for 12 hours. Other residents of Khaza'a were shot at and forced to march to a school in the village center. They were found, there they found hundreds of other residents who had been rounded up from nearby villages. Israeli forces then shot phosphorus shells at the school, forcing the civilians to flee. Palestinian Red Crescent and International Red Cross ambulances then evacuated the civilians to a nearby village. I'll stop there. I share those, you might recognize those as outdated. I did mention the year 2009. I personally collected those testimonies as part of a National Lawyers Guild fact, legal fact-finding delegation in late January, early February 2009, following Israel's first major onslaught of the Gaza Strip that we know um, as Operation Cast Lead. We knew then of Israel's tactics of targeting civilians. We knew then of Israel's tactics of targeting civilian infrastructure, of its use of phosphorus shells. We knew then of Israel's use of very racist tropes that have a tremendous amount of political cachet, as indicated by Daryl, that all of its operations were in response to um, Hamas, militants hiding somewhere uh, behind civilians. This um, report that we produced in 2009, we took, we, we, we mobilized across Congress um, with the State Department in order to enact the Arms Export Control Act, basically to trigger U.S. law that limits the sale of U.S. weapons where they will not be used in compliance with human rights law, with the Leahy Amendment, which imposes similar restrictions. This was also followed by the Goldstone Report, which similarly found that Israel had, in fact, enacted the Dahia Doctrine, a doctrine it developed in its warfare against Lebanon, and specifically against Hezbollah militants, whereby it explained that there when that there are no civilians, that no one will be considered a civilian where it is targeting um, um, Hezbollah, even if they are characterized as residential neighborhoods. The Goldstone Report not only echoed what Israel said itself about the Dahi Doctrine, but then found that it was exemplified in the Gaza Strip during Operation Cast Lead. I begin with this to indicate that we have, that what we're seeing right now has been done before um, and reflects a crisis of accountability of the failure to hold Israel to account for well-documented uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity as we've seen before. Now, that, that might seem quite obvious, but the offering that I want to make here and my intervention that I want to make here is not only a failure to hold Israel to account, which reflects this compliance problem um, that Professor Falk had indicated, but to go further and to say that upon, it's upon the very foundation of this lack of accountability that new violations can be sustained. So the first one I want to indicate is the violation of prolonged military occupation, which has not only usurped right, the right to self-determination, but has produced new violations as we've seen in this moment. Israel has failed to withdraw from territory that it occupies. It has failed to end its occupation. That on it, and, it, and it's done so uh, for a prolonged period of time, which then creates new violations of law. But upon this chronic lack of accountability, we have now a new claim, which is that Israel is attacking a territory under the framework of self-defense where it cannot actually reach or claim self-defense. So Israel says that it has the right to use self-defense against um, in response to the October 7th attack. But because Israel is the occupying power, in the Gaza Strip, as has been affirmed by the ICC, as well as multiple international organs. In fact, Israel does not have the right to self-defense 
against territory which it occupies because initially it usurped the policing power from that population and has a duty and a responsibility to protect those civilians, right? Now, Israel has not only not ended its occupation, but then says that it can use self-defense to protect territory that is, is, is in essentially a colonial taking and echoes the prohibition on such use of force as was proclaimed against Portugal and its attempt to use such force to protect its holdings in Mozambique and Angola, as well as apartheid South Africa and its attempt to maintain its hold um, on South Africa and its, its denial of self-determination for an indigenous South African people. In this situation, the International Court of Justice said in 2004, in paragraph 139, it echoed this finding that Israel does not have the right to self-defense against territory that it occupies. Another way that we can look at it is to think that if it is under occupation, therefore the, the principle of use ad bellum or the right to use force has already been triggered, which means at this point it needs to be regulated, use ad bellum, um, it now needs to be regulated under you know a hostilities framework of use in bello. And to say that there are many different ways to uh, uh, arrive at this, but the point is, is 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 basic in that the the issue now we're fighting is to push back on uh, against this idea of israel not having a right to self-defense against um a territory that it occupies which is is only made possible and in fact exacerbated because of a failure to end the occupation at all similarly uh similarly Genocide in this moment, as articulated by by um, professors Lee and Falk, would not be possible were it not, in my opinion, would not be possible were it not for a chronic lack of accountability to append apartheid. Genocide is a racist project. It is an eliminatory project that is made possible by the degradation of certain life. It makes common sense. It makes the loss of that life, it makes the suffering of, of certain communities common sense and acceptable in a way that reflects a deep and harrowing racialization project. Well, for years, if not decades, Palestinians as well as others have indicated that Israel oversees an apartheid regime that this is not merely a system of military occupation, but it's a system that is driven by a racist ideology in the form of Zionism that is built on the twin axioms of genocidal, um, genocidal expansion and territorial consolidation. And so here, and then in 2020, a number of mainstream human rights or legacy human rights organizations, as well as Israeli human rights organizations, also come to the conclusion that Israel oversees an apartheid regime. And rather than append this racist structure, this racial form of uh, governance and colonialism, because apartheid represents a racial colonial structure, the United States was rewarding and normalizing genocide, excuse me, apartheid um, in Israel, and in fact was rewarding it with normalizing its relations with other Arab regimes right before October 7th. We were on the precipice of witnessing a possible um, normalization of relations between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel. And so upon that basis, that chronic lack of accountability to deal with apartheid, we now are able, um, it facilitates an entirely new violation of genocide that, as I mentioned, in my opinion, would not have been possible without that racialization project. So here to emphasize that the chronic lack of accountability is not just missed opportunity or a failure of international law supposed promise, but in fact creates the bedrock for violations um, that we could not, well, we probably could have anticipated, but that could not be possible without that lack of accountability and actually will produce 
Now, other arguments that we have to deal with that take us away, for example, that might distract us from these root causes that are sustaining these conditions. So finally, what I want to end with is part of that lack of, account lack of accountability and part of this phenomenon is also the insistence that Israel has made in you know, law a very much a legal argument and one of, I think, its um, technologies in, in sustaining its uh, settler colonial project has been to use the language of law in order to create exceptions for itself. And so very much in the same way, why is it that we haven't ended, why, that we haven't succeeded in ending um, Israeli occupation? Well, obviously there's political intransigence and much that we can discuss there geopolitically, but one of the main technologies has been Israel's insistence that this isn't an occupation at all, right? That this is a sui generis regime, unlike anything else right? Whereby the t uh, Palestinian territories aren't in fact Palestinian, they belong to no sovereign, therefore Israel can be present there and adhere to occupation law as a matter of fact, but not as a matter of law, in order to enable itself to have legitimacy and legality to be in the territory without any of the restrictions imposed by occupation law that prohibit it from changing the juridical, demographic, political status quo. Similar, Israel has created an exception that in its, in its withdrawal from its troops from the Gaza Strip in 2005, that Gaza at the end of occupation, supposed end of occupation, is not sovereign, right? But is also not occupied. It created a new category and described it as a hostile entity enabling it to engage with Gaza in a way that we see today where because of a lack of sovereignty, neither have, you know, are not recognized as, as um, sovereigns with the right to use force to protect themselves or con conduct their economic business or diplomatic relations and are not, um, are not protected by occupation law that would make their wealth, civilian well-being, the responsibility of Israel, but instead have created this exception. We see the same thing when Israel says that it is not engaged in an international armed conflict with uh, Palestinians, which would recognize all Palestinians as nascent sovereigns, nor a non-international armed conflict that would recognize them as part of a, a body politic that would characterize this as a civil war. Instead, it is an armed conflict short of war that enables Israel to use military force against the people that cannot use any force in response. These exceptions continue. And the exception that we're seeing um, forwarded and advanced today is in fact, in my opinion, an, an exception for genocide. Israel is not telling us that they're not targeting Palestinians, is not telling us, is not denying that they're targeting hospitals and civilian infrastructure and forcibly displacing Palestinians to the south before the line of Wadi Gaza. They're very much saying they're doing all of that. In fact, Avi Dichter has said explicitly that this is the Gaza Nakba, drawing along that 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 the the, the, the language of Nakba dispossession and removal. But what Israel is insisting upon is that Nakba is necessary to ensure Israel's self-defense. That genocide is necessary to ensure Israel's self-defense. When they tell us that this is a military campaign to decimate Hamas, but then that military campaign is actually decimating the entire people, they're making it clear that Israel's self-defense is contingent on the decimation of a, on the destruction of a Palestinian people in order to protect itself. So again, we're seeing a continuation of, of, of this use of exception, which Israel affords to itself in order to not only say, no, we're not getting away with this. We have a right, we have a right to do this um, and to use the language of law to do so. Um, the last thing I'll say, just the, the fourth and final point, and this is about the legacies of genocide and how Palestinians, you know, as much as, you know, I'm saying that what Israel is doing is, is to advance this exceptional framework um, is in fact not exceptional, but is a condition 
that many other peoples, indigenous, um, African descendant, colonized peoples know very well, right? Um, who have survived apocalypse um, before is the exclusion of, of, of categories of indigenous and brown and black bodies from the category of the civilian. Very explicitly um, excluded from the category of civilian during the establishment of the Liber Codes, um, you know, uh, uh, laws of war um, that were created during the US Civil War that never recognized indigenous peoples as civilians and therefore sanctioned their massacre. Um, but once, you know, if Daryl is describing to us, excuse me, Professor Lee is describing to us that genocide becomes proscribed in 1948, but genocide had been practiced well before 1948 across these colonial geographies, right? How is it that we don't recognize? How is it that we don't recognize the destruction of people before this moment that it happens within Europe's shores? It is because of the non-recognition of indigenous brown and black bodies in the category of the civilian that sustains this legacy the first recognition that we have of them legally is in the fourth geneva convention in 1949 that recognized these populations as having protection and being um uh you know being recognized as agents within international law but we then we see it even more explicitly in 1977 in the first additional protocols and the second additional protocols but specifically AP1 um, and Article 50 that not only recognizes um, non-combatants as civilians who are supposed to be given protection and, and are never legitimate targets, but even imposes upon state belligerents the duty to refrain from military op uh, operations where the risk of injuring those civilians is quite high. So that these, mo these atrocities that we're witnessing right now have been considered, have been legislated by a third world movement that was filling in these gaps. And yet now we're living in a moment where this chronic lack of accountability together with the insistence on exception is creating these conditions um, that we're both witnessing in horrifying ways, but also I, all of us together are fighting against. Thank you, uh, Nura, Daryl, and Richard, and Lisa. We are going to move to a uh, conversation that Lisa will um, basically um, lead. We have uh, three platforms on which we're live and uh, some other uh, sort of uh, informal uh, connections that are sending us all sorts of emails and questions. but. Unfortunately, given that we're already one hour in, we will start with Lisa's and just a couple of my questions. And if we have time to take on other questions, we will. This probably will not be the last iteration of the discussion of international law. So apologies if we don't get to some of your questions, uh, precluding the uh, very sweetly racist comments on some of the feeds. Lisa, it's all you. Thank you. Well, I think this has been really fascinating. And, you know, one of the important things in a panel like this is, you know, taking the, the you know, law as a lens to understand reality. One of the paradoxes of what's happening now is that we can see, like, it's sort of like, who are you going to believe? Me or your lying eyes? We can see what's happening in Gaza. We can understand what international law says. And then we hear these rhetorics of, you know, the illegal being legal, the, you know, the crimes being non-crimes, the, uh, you know, the status of the enemy being, you know, sort of available to be genocided or whatever. So I think that, you know, one thing I wanted to I'll sort of fold it back to Richard, you know, we're, we're seeing like, one of the things we see is a lot of the history of this war now, it's in some ways it's unprecedented, but as each of you has talked about, the violence has historical roots. But when it comes to international humanitarian law in the 21st century, we've really seen the emergence of what I would characterize as this counterterrorism uh, war paradigm in which international law is you know, misinterpreted or interpreted in ways that allow for 
you know, targeted killing, um, you know, torture, other kinds of things. And the U.S. and Israel have played a major role in constructing this kind of a model. And we see it, um, you know, playing out now in the rhetoric versus uh, reality. So, Richard, I wanted to just ask you, like, one of the things that's been very clear for people who know anything about international law and then, you know, thinking about the position that the United States government, the Biden administration and other sectors of the government have taken, which is to deny and not see what is literally in front of everybody's eyes about the, the war crimes targeting um, civilian infrastructure, the mass killing. So, you know, what was paradoxical about that was, you know, that the United States, which completely violated and disregarded international law with the start of the war on terror, um, you know, was kind of like suddenly moving towards an embrace of uh, the enforceability of international law and the International Criminal Court with the Russian uh, war on Ukraine, you know, and all of the things that have been criticized by the Biden administration as war crimes, bombing hospitals, torture, uh, mass killing of civilians is now completely absent from U.S. rhetoric on Israel. What do you think the geopolitical ramifications for that kind of grotesque hypocrisy are. You're muted. You're muted. I wish I could give you a honest, optimistic response, uh, but I can't. I mean, the, everything that Nora and Daryl had to say in my from my perspective underscores this problem of the crisis what you, what Nora was calling the crisis of accountability uh, and I was calling the crisis of implementation until you have an effective way to challenge the primacy of geopolitics Government lawyers will always find the root of exception. It's embedded in the ambiguity of language. It's uh, embedded a second time in what Daryl was referring to in terms of how uh, legal instruments are formulated to always leave room for controversy as to their application so that you can have all these legal imperatives but the behavior doesn't change and until you can have some way of overriding this geopolitical primacy i don't see how the pattern can be shifted except by the mobilization of people and civil society. So I think it's, it's a challenge to challenge and an opportunity to civil society, but it requires an unprecedented mobilization to really challenge what has been for centuries the norm, which is that law gives way to geopolitical priorities. Thank you. I just going to have to say one comment and then I'll turn it over to uh, Bassam to ask Daryl a question. But since all three of you are lawyers, uh, you know, one of the uh, things that I often teach um, legal issues to non-lawyers, to undergraduate students and say, one of the things I think that these kinds of teachings about international humanitarian law are important is like the law is not rocket science. If people can read, they can understand the basic tenets of law and you use that to judge the world, the realities of the world. So Basam, I'm going to turn it over to you for a question to Daryl. Yes, thank you. I have actually a couple, one for Daryl and we're picking one up from, from uh, folks. Um, so Daryl, is there a valuable role for IHL, however you interpret value in the in the context of armed resistance to states of siege and apartheid? Of, and if so, what, what would that role be? Well, I think I think we're seeing that value play out right now with the captive exchanges and the truce. So the thing with international humanitarian law, which is a nice way of saying the laws of war, 
um, which is a nice way of saying trying to take incredibly violent things and like give them some framework of limitation. Um, you know, I'm very critical of IHL and how it legitimizes violence, but I one of the reasons why I can't see myself jettisoning it entirely is that um, in situations of armed struggle and antagonism, um, there's always, I think, going to be some need for, um, for limits and for agreements. And it doesn't matter. I mean, look, look this, is, this is why Israel, this is why exchanges of captives drive colonizers crazy, crazy, right? Because they can go off as much as they want about how the, the Hamas are terrorists and these people are uncivilized and we'll never negotiate with them and blah, 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 blah. But when you are not the only side who is depriving people of their liberty, suddenly you find yourself in a situation of forced parity where you have to negotiate, where you have to implicitly recognize that there is another political entity and, you know, in, in the various IHL treaties, there's usually language around encouraging parties to the conflict to um, come to informal agreements and to build on them, right? So there's always this delicate balance in IHL between self-interest, which has a kind of like reciprocal dimension to it, and a sort of higher aspiration to like humanity or whatever, right? And you can't entirely separate one of these things from the other. Right? So when it comes to captive exchanges in any asymmetrical or colonial situation, not just in Palestine and many, many other anti-colonial conflicts, um, the, the captive exchange is one of those places where the colonizer is forced into some kind of um, mutual promise keeping with the other side, right? which despite all of their dehumanizing, violent, colonial, genocidal, everything, is forced recognition of the humanity of the other, right? Like we know this, like all language of dehumanization. When Yoav Galant says, oh, these are human animals, like I think Fred Moten said this in a podcast recently. He's like, well, you know, he didn't say inhuman animals, right? He still recognized that there's a humanity there. And the dehumanizing language is this denial of something that they actually know fundamentally to be true, which is that no matter what they say, no matter what they do, the people on the other side are human, and that's why they're struggling for freedom, right? And situations of armed conflict actually force those questions of agency to the forefront, right? And when you have, when you when you make agreements, you know, as as tentative as they might be, as limited as they might be, that recognizes a possibility that the entire discourse is actually trying to deny at the same time. Very quick follow up, Lisa, uh, and this can, Daryl, you can take this and or anyone else, but it it actually picks up on the IHL. Uh, how can the West call settlements? And I quote the viewer: "Grave breach of IHL, but not the raising of apartment blocks and the killing of twenty thousand people, eighty six percent of them civilians." The viewers' numbers. Does this mean that focusing on settler vigilantes is the best way to win arms embargo slash aid conditioning? Um, I'm not totally sure if I, if I understood the question, but I think settlements and mass destruction of property are both like obviously war crimes. Um, in terms of which Western governments recognize them as such, that speaks to all of the geopolitical questions that uh, Professor Falk spoke about. Um, I do want to pick up on the settler vigilantism. Um, I don't think this is like a news flash to most of the people in the audience, but I, I do think it's... Um, really a distraction to have a discourse around what settler vigilantes are doing um, because the ultimate framework is that the, it's it's based on on an appeal to the government of Israel to quote unquote do the right thing and rein these people in when it's obvious that these constituencies are actually members of the of the governing coalition um, so you know all of Biden's talk about maybe having some visa you know like miss me with that also I don't know if visa restrictions are even going to matter because I imagine a number of these people are U.S. citizens anyway. So um, I, I would be I'd be less interested in keeping them outside of the United States than maybe keeping them inside the United States. 
Okay, I think I'm mindful of time. So Nora, we're going to finish up with a uh, question for you. I mean, you've been doing such amazing work, whether you know you want to speak to what it's been like to talk about the crimes being perpetrated against Palestinians in the media. But what is what are maybe two or three of the things that you just want people to take away from this in terms of like thinking about the issues, the legal issues that are current conflict and including how it's it, it's it's not unprecedented in the sense that there's been violence of its sort in the past um i th i think that the idea here that i want to emphasize more than and above everything is that we cannot cede ground um in what's happening to the lawyers here because the law is not going to resolve this issue as you pointed out lisa and your excellent work the you know the law is basically another terrain of battle um, upon which to fight. And as everyone here has pointed out, le the work you know legal work is precisely that is to use the loopholes to make the arguments that advance the best outcome for your client. So the last thing that we want to do in this discussion is to cede a ground that is based on morality and based on what we could see very clearly to some sort of legal expertise to make that decision knowing full well um how loaded that you know even the construction of the law is and its implementation i mean consider that you know i i was part of the legal team that filed a petition to the icc that did charge israel with genocide in this instance i have insisted that we understand this as genocide to audiences in part to emphasize to them and to pierce um, this, this false framework that this is a defense, that Israel is waging a defensive war. Israel is waging a war, as I said at the end, that has equated its self-defense with the removal of Palestinian people with another Nakba, right? And so how do you pierce through that? Um, and one of the ways I found to do that is just to say explicitly, right, this is a campaign of ethnic cleansing, one that is going to, you know, not only destroy a people in whole or in part, but that actually takes on the conditions of life that is meant with, if you destroy those conditions of life, you destroy them in whole or in part. And so it becomes a way to pierce through what becomes an otherwise very convoluted conversation where I'm so you know, frustrated to say that our media core has failed at its basic job of investigation and interrogation and even asking basic questions, but instead because they parrot so many of these talking points, then it because you know, this is a way to get them to actually be on defensive um, ground. And so back to this idea, we filed this petition at the ICC uh, Kamal, the office of the prosecutor, Kamal Khan, number one, hasn't taken this up at all and has had a file open since um, 20, the Palestine file open since 2021, and yet was able within a week of Russia's invasion of Ukraine to initiate a case against Russia and actually put, not Russia, excuse me, because this, this prosecutes individuals, but to put out an, a, a warrant for Vla Vladimir Putin. And now we are, what, 53 days into this campaign and have not seen anything similar. The other thing, and this is sad, and I want to let the audience know, international law is not political in many, it, it depoliticizes, I should say, in many ways. And there's also a petition against Hamas for genocide at the ICC. And so one of the things that, that, that happens here is that because we're depoliticizing this context, we can do what Elon Musk said, right? Where he said that decolonization and saying river to the sea is genocidal. And now we have, you know, the weaponization of law in order to protect colonialism. And so the, the point that I would emphasize here is that what you see is real. Do not gaslight yourself. Do not cede this ground to any kind of legal expertise um, or knowledge. But in fact, if, if those of us who are part of this field are doing that, we're also doing it in a way that recognizing a very contentious terrain um, that we, not, we don't necessarily trust either.
great. Thank you. Well, I think we are out of time, but it's been a really riveting conversation and I appreciate all of your contributions. And for anybody who's interested, um, you know, just Google each of the author's names and war crimes or genocide, and you will come up with many uh, publications, including on uh, Jedalia. So thank you, Bassam, for organizing this. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to everyone here, Richard, Daryl, and uh, Noura. Uh, these teachings are going to be further curated so they, they can be made available as pedagogic tools, and we will have a few more before the end of the year. Uh, as I shared earlier, please feel free to visit palestineincontext.org for all of the teachings. All the videos are there, even though they are on Jadalia's um, YouTube channel. And you'll also find the War on Terrorism podcast, which is a 20-minute podcast produced twice a week that catches you up if you've been a bit behind. And um, finally, we will be back next week with a uh, teaching on the media, the question of the media, which is a very important uh, topic. And we hope to see you all soon. I will... Um, I will also share that there all the bios are always on Jadalia on the front page all of the uh, events are listed with all of the bios and all the information and all sorts of links connected to them if you'd like to learn more about the speakers thank you all very much and hope to see you all soon